for the prepared answer, and it's not the same thing. You met Shimon Peres and asked him probably the most profound question, the most secret question you could ask a guy. Say back. Yeah, I, I totally remember this. I, I think it was actually a few weeks before we did the um, <laughs> we did the uh, lecture ride. Uh, the two at Hebrew University, but he was a, an invited guest at Hebrew University, and um, I had a friend of mine with me, and basically, or, or maybe it was, I, I think it might have been actually shortly after, but either way, it was sometime around then, and um, I got to ask a question, um, and this is at Hebrew University where you're speaking, and I asked him, um, you know, basically whether he had any kind of involvement with any secret clauses of Oslo and the Oslo II Accords, and whether he had passed those on to the Vatican, as I had read in several reports, including yours. Beautiful. And, uh, you were the first ahead. person to ask him what his secret allegiances really are, and, and what Oslo was, and who was behind it. You don't understand today, maybe, that you were the first to do it. Well, I, I may have been the first to do it, but um, what I did was a, I played a little a, a little chess move with him because he, of course, flatly denied it and you know denied any mention of what I was talking about. I, and I try remember, and remember his point. answer. What's that? Try and remember his answer. I vaguely do. Oh well, he well there's two there's two sets of this. The first part where he just kind of flatly denied it. And he's like, I don't, under, I don't know anything about what you're talking, blah, 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 blah. And so I followed up by saying, hey, um, supposedly, according to these reports, um, the, the French author, Mark Halter, actually hand-delivered these, you know, these, these, these agreements to the Vatican on your behalf. And he, you know, and, and all the stuff, and he's looking at me. And I said, and I had no idea this was a total bluff on my part. And I said, and... And from what I've seen, Mark Halter is still your friend. And if it were me and my friend had gone to the Vatican saying that these secret agreements, you know, where I had basically sold out Jerusalem, that these secret agreements were from my hand, and this was supposedly a friend of mine, I'd no longer be friends with him, but you're still friends with him. So how is that? And he turned white as a ghost. And he was silent for, I'm guessing, 30, 40 seconds. And what was amazing is that the room was dead silent. And most of the people that knew me from, you know, my school, they knew I would ask these off-the-wall questions that, you know, that unfortunately they never had the context to, to really understand because they were caught up in the paradigm of the, of the mainstream media, even in Israel at the time. And so I'm asking this question, and they probably think I'm crazy, but he's just sitting there in absolute silence and white as a goat. I mean, just all color, just law. I mean, and he just, I mean, just sat there. But he gave and then his a response, short answer. And then his response was, well, that's, that's absurd. You know, there's no basis to any of this. You know, there's 70 faces to the Torah, you know, and, and anyone can spin anything, any other, you know, any way that they want. Something along those lines. What I understand is that nobody can give away a city was part of his answer. You know, it, it might have been. I don't remember that part of it. Um, I don't remember that part of it, but of course, well, I'm assuming since you follow this a little bit more. In well, the last, I'm, what, I'm last... remembering what you told me, and it, it's been a while. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that sentence, sure. uh, it's absurd. Nobody can give away a city. Uh, was... and, he might, and he might very well have said that. I don't recall that at the moment. Now look, I have to do this so we get some context in what you did. This was a moment, a historical moment. What you did was you read an article that I and Joel Bainman wrote in something called Inside Israel. We were the first deep political newsletter. We quoted the Marek Halter piece from Shishi and from La Stampa in Italy that gave away, well, Shimon Paris was left out of Oslo. So to get even, he 
gives a letter to his friend, the French intellectual Mark Halter, offering the Vatican hegemony over all the holy places of Jerusalem. And by the way, it gets even weirder than this. Uh, later on, it was published in, in the Italian media, uh, well, the Stampa, uh, a major, major news magazine, that Paris's view is that uh, uh, the Vatican will give the PLO a capital in this enclave, and that Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, would be an international city with no duty, uh, no passports needed at the airport. This was the wackier part of the scheme. But you got. Uh, it the sounds like it's right out of the 37 Peel Commission, you know? The 1937 Peel Commission and. You know the other th the other other resolutions that they had set up for you know through the United Nations very early on. Oh, you lost. I mean that that's what, how I read it as a, as a Jewish historian at the time. What what does the Peel Commission say that's even remotely similar to what Paris actually did? Well, back in back in the early before the the State of Israel was founded and before the you know the uh, the war in forty eight. Um, they, you know, there were these disparate little, um, we we'll call them regions, both for both for the Arabs living in the historical, you know, uh, Palestine Mandate, and and the Jews, um, and they were all discontiguous areas that were going to be these two kind of nations. But there was going to be this central corridor that was going to be internationalized under the Vatican, and that went from like Tel Aviv Yafo to Jerus you know, to Jerusalem. Is it actually so, the Vatican? I, yeah, I'm almost positive. In fact, I'm about 99.9% .9 sure that the Vatican was included in some of those proposals. I don't remember exactly which ones now, because, again, we're talking 15 years ago. You know, when I said that's a very significant uh, piece of uh, more than historical trivia. If the Vatican... Are you sure about this? Yeah, I can... Uh, yeah, I, can, I mean, I'm free to look well, it up. Don't look it up. When the show it. ends, I'm going to go look it up. But if so, that, that's... That's not a trivial piece of information. Right, and that's why I'm saying from my perspective I considered it, um, you know, just an extension of that, of that, um, you know, of that policy. Well, just try and imagine the foreign minister of Israel, uh, well, now he's the prime minister since he knocked off a beam. <laughs> I mean, he was the foreign minister when he gave the Vatican this offer. And right. it's been a... Mostly, do you know the magazine she she where Joel and I got the uh, original tip was like closed two weeks after they wrote that thing. I uh, do remember that, or I remember that story. Yeah. When Paris gets found out, the other side uh, feels immense pressure to go bankrupt. <laughs> you know, without diving into it, yeah, the magazine closed down. <laughs> within a month, I think it was, uh, after reporting this. But you confronted him in front of a serious audience. You know, Hebrew University is, is not a, um, an unserious location. I imagine there was media there as well. Consider it the uh, the Georgetown, or you know, of Israel, or the Harvard of Israel. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the it's the only major university in you know, the country's capital, you know, so I consider it kind of a, a Harvard, Yale, or a, or even a Georgetown if we want to get a little bit more, you know, in the Washington, D.C. area. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, causing Paris to blanch, um, if you consider that an accomplishment, um, I would say that after the Rabin lecture that you organized, he blanched many, many times more after that. You just didn't see it. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, and, and I don't know if this is where you're going with this, but I saved some of the articles, I think this past spring or, or last fall a year ago, that he's come out publicly now and stated that's his actual policy that he believes. Um, I mean, I, I think Haagats reported it and several other newspapers reported that it's actually his belief and and now his official policy that he believes, you know, the Vatican should basically rule over, you know, Jerusalem. Um, please send me anything and everything you've got on this. I'm going to reopen this as fast as I can. Um, look, this isn't the time, but the Vatican are 
going as fast as they've ever gone to a conference in Barcelona next month, uh, which they promise will bring peace, and the Pope is going to be there. This has not died out. And again, if you say all the way back to 1937, uh, this has been, the Vatican is somehow, um, well, the diplomacy is dead to the British Parliament, a parliamentary well, commission. Well, I, ju I just, before the, before uh, the music, Brian, too much. Brian, uh, hang on to the line. I'm going to be back in three minutes. Did you hear? I'm here. Perfect. After the music and the commercials end, we'll continue this discussion. Sounds good.